The headset is one of the unsung heroes on a mountain bike. Certainly one of my favorite parts of the bike. Sits up the front, it does so with minimal fuss and it puts up with all the stress that you have from long travel forks going through the front of the frame. And it does so without even answering back. But it never used to be like that. Headsets have come an awful long way. So today we're gonna pay homage to the headset and we're gonna look at the original headsets which are quite shonky and see just how far we've come and where we might be going in the future. Now the modern headset system is actually very simple. You have a steerer tube on the bike which is made from aluminium. Uh, they're provided long, uh, you cut them down to the length and basically fit them to your bike. In the frame you have two cups, you have bearings that sit into those cups, you have a cap that goes on the top, you have a stem that goes on the top and clamps onto that steerer tube of the bike and then you have a bolt that pulls it all together thanks to this little star nut that sits on the inside. There's really nothing to it. And all adjustment is done with either a five millimeter Allen key for the top, or perhaps a four millimeter on your stem. Literally, that is it. You can adjust it anytime, any place, anywhere. Okay, so the traditional headset, as you can see right here, at a glance, you might be forgiven, in fact, for thinking it's just a regular headset. So this is an old GT Zascar frame, and it's a skinny old Pace RC36 fork on the front. Now, if I lift the bike up, you'll see the fact that the fork doesn't drop out because it uses a totally different system to the clamp-on stem that we see today. If you were to undo the stem on your bike, your fork can simply just drop out. That's the beauty of the system. On these ones, it was a little bit different. So another example of the fork here, this is what is on the inside, a steel steerer tube, unlike the aluminium one, and it's threaded at the top. It had to be steel in order to get a good thread on there. Now the headset itself basically screws onto here. You have these big nuts on the top, it basically adjusts that headset. One nut is literally to preload that bearing, and the other nut you would screw against the nut to lock it in place, it's a locking nut. And to do that, you essentially needed two of these, one for each big nut there, basically. So um, not exactly convenient. And these things used to rattle loose all the time, more often than not, when you're out riding as well. And you wouldn't be carrying a set of those with you, would you? It's just not realistic. So you'd have to try and screw it up by hand and get to a local bike shop as quick as possible. Now, as far as sizing went, you used to get these in one inch steerer tubes, 1.125 inch or inch and an eighth, which you see on this one. And then a bit later, the 1.25 or inch and a quarter, which is also known as Evolution, a size system introduced by Gary Fisher on his range of bikes. Bit by bit, they were all slowly phased out, which we're gonna to get to. Now on the inside, you had regular bearings. Quite often they were loose bearings. This one has caged bearings on the inside, uh, which you can just about see here. They're in a bit of a bad state to be fair, but uh, this hasn't exactly been maintained. But the fact that they were loose bearings and not in a cartridge race that you see on modern headsets meant that when these came loose when you're out riding, sometimes they'd come so loose you'd actually lose bearings from them. Uh, and I don't need to spell that out. Not exactly good. We've not even talked about the stem yet either. Now, ignoring the fact that this is one of the uh, craziest things ever designed. It's a flex stem. We'll talk about that in another video altogether. Look at how it's mounted to the bike. It doesn't have a clamp to clamp it onto the steerer tube. It has this big quill design that goes inside using an expander wedge. Yep, you have a big steel heavy bolt running through there. So you're getting this, a steel steerer tube, a steel bolt, an expander wedge system that to be fair was actually really unreliable. So yes, you did have convenience of being able to adjust it up and down very slightly, which you don't get with the modern headsets quite as much, but the fact is these were never completely tight. So in a crash, they would move around, which wasn't necessarily a bad thing, but sometimes they did when you're riding. It was an awful system. So the bottom line is you had an unreliable, heavy system for mounting the stem. You had this heavy steel steerer tube system and you needed two whacking great spanners to adjust your headset. Yeah, not exactly ideal, was it? Thankfully, an aspiring mountain bike rider and designer by the name of John Rader came up with a much more simplified system. Now, John was born with engineering in his roots and the moniker he lived by was definitely what's good enough is definitely not good enough. So he set about redesigning this awful old system with a steel threaded steerer tube and a big awful quill system on there. So he simplified it by removing that from the equation and having a stem that clamped directly onto the steerer tube. Now he got an early prototype together with this and essentially took this to the first mountain bike world championships in Durango, Colorado in 1990 and showed it to anyone that would give him the time of day. And one of those companies was called Diacomp USA. Now Diacomp was well known in those days for producing, manufacturing, 
the first suspension fork, the RockShox RS1. And because of that, their tray stand was insanely busy with racers and riders trying to get hold of a set of those early forks. But he did manage to get just a few short minutes with them to pitch his new product. And in just 30 seconds, he removed the stem, dropped the fork out of the bike and reassembled it again. Something that just couldn't be done with the regular system because of the amount of spanners and different tooling that you needed. So instantly he drew their attention and they ended up actually buying the patent from him and working with him to simplify and improve the design. So this new headset design was known as the A headset and it was brought to the market in around 1992 by Cane Creek Components, which was the new name for Dicomp USA. And it was actually a company that was bought from the sister company in Japan by the employees of the US franchise there. And it was named Cane Creek Components after the Cane Creek Valley in which it was located in North Carolina. Anyhow, the A headset system essentially is everywhere today. It's such a simplified system, and I just wanna show you just how good it is. Now this one is an old Crank Brothers Direct set, and literally, that is all there is to it. So few parts. You have your crown race, that sits on the fork. You might notice this is a skinny little one. This was for a, a straight steerer tube. You have your bottom cup that goes into the frame, and the bearing's already in this cup. You have the top cup that goes into the frame, the bearing in that cup. You have your compression ring, it's a split ring that applies just enough force to preload the bearing so there's no play of the steerer tube. You have the top cap that goes onto that, and then into the steerer tube you have the star fangled nut, and then you literally adjust it from the top with a five millimeter bolt and a cap. And all that star fangled nut does is literally pull that steerer tube up slightly just to take up any slack in the system. Cartridge bearings, of course, don't need any adjustment. It literally is to take up the play to make sure the headset moves nice and freely. Now, a star fangled nut was actually the major thing that happened when Diacomp combined forces with John Rader because they needed a way to preload that bearing that was more simplified than John's original design. And the story behind these is actually quite cool. Rumor has it that an employee at Diacomp literally had a wheel fall off his office chair. Flip the chair upside down to have a look at the system so you could put the wheel back in place and noted there was a threaded insert welded into the leg of the chair, much like one of these. Brilliant piece of kit, star fangled nut was born and this whole system with a five millimeter allen key replaced having to use two of these massive spanners. What a great system. Okay, so how the A headset or the headset system developed. Now, when Cane Creek brought it to the market, they had the A-head system patented, so you basically had to license it in order to reproduce them. So not many brands really did that. But in 2010, when that patent expired, the floodgates opened and loads of different brands started developing essentially threadless headset systems that worked on an identical basis. But Cane Creek developed loads of other cool products along the way, one of which was the angle set. And this was a way of adjusting the head tube angle on your bike using these very cool cups. So this one had a almost a zero stack top cup, an external bottom cup. You can get these to suit 1.5, one or half a degree adjustments. So you could have that steeper or slacker. And the cool thing about this is it used a gimbal system. So your bearings would sit inside this little gimbal and it would enable it to sit at the correct angle on your frame. A very cool intricate system. Sounds a bit crazy, but actually makes a lot of sense when you actually look at the cups up close. It would enable the steerer tube to sit at a slightly different angle in your frame. However, these were quite complex due to the fact that you needed a different upper and a lower cup system, and it needed to take into account the frame design you had, the length of the head tube that you had, and the type of steerer tube you had. As frames developed, of course, different headsets were needed to basically compensate for the length of the head tubes, the different size forks, and all sorts of things going into frames. As a result, there were loads of different headset offerings available and it became a nightmare trying to identify which you might need to fit in any particular frame. So the SHIS system, also known as the Standardized Headset Identification System, was announced basically to really simplify things. You had a simple code followed by a number to identify the style of cup needed and the size of cup. So you would have EC, ZS, and IS. EC stood for external cup. That is an external cup. The bearing sits in this, this sits into the frame. Now it might be an EC56, which would mean 56 millimeter, or it might be an EC44, whatever it might be. That's what the EC stood for. Then you would get ZS. That stands for zero stack. 
Now this is a zero stack offering. Essentially it's as flat as possible, almost completely flush with the top of the frame. So this one is a ZS44. So it's a 44 mil head tube and zero stack design system. And then you used to get the IS system. Now this was an integrated system of headset where essentially the bearing sits directly into the frame. You achieve a very similar result that you do with the zero stack system, only you don't need the cups to be pressed in the frame. The bearing just sits in the frame itself. But that is actually quite complex because the frame manufacturer needs to make sure that the surfaces are prepared on the head tube itself in order to accept the bearing. It's why mountain biking, you tend to only really see this on much more lightweight cross-country style frames. It's very popular in the road world, mind. But of course, it's much more common these days in mountain biking to see the Zero Stack or the ZS system. It's very neat. It enables you to have a whole plethora of different headsets on the bike. And as you can see, it was very neat as well. Now, along with the fact that headsets themselves started evolving, but bikes did too, suspension forks got longer, so accordingly, we needed to develop more things to go on the front of a bike. Now, the traditional steel tubes were one inch in diameter. Very skinny, they were always made from steel, and they were, of course, threaded. Progressing from there came the Evolution size, which is 1.25 or inch and a quarter. Again, that only really was seen on Gary Fisher bikes back in the day and I quickly moved aside. Next up came the inch and an eighth, also known as 1.125 inch. Now this is a very common size. It was typically a straight steer tube and you used to get these in threaded. And later on down the line, you got those in non-threaded or threadless design made from aluminium, of course. Now the biggest advancement was when things started getting a bit bigger. Now Cannondale actually bought a device out called the Head Shock, which was an enormous head tube on a bike, and it actually housed a shock mechanism on the inside. Now this was nearly 1.5 in diameter, it was 1.56 I think it was to be precise. Um, so it wasn't compatible with the 1.5 standard that came out shortly after. Now 1.5, as you can see, is absolutely colossal. Look at it compared to the inch steer tube. It's almost laughable. But this was definitely needed when forks like this huge fork from RockShox came out on the market. Things were getting longer in travel, so you needed a much stiffer front end. The 1.5 system coped with that unbelievably. But the downside of such a big heavy duty system was the fact you needed a massive headset on there. I mean, look at the size of this headset compared to this one. It's just insane the difference in weight the sheer amount of bearing size, and even the star nut that went on the inside was absolutely colossal. The stem was bigger, and of course, the massive head tube to house the steer tube like this made frames of that era almost look comical. But thankfully, this was pushed aside in favor of the tapered system when it was realized that we simply don't need to have a steer tube as big as that. So tapered system is what is most familiar today. It's 1.5 at the bottom and 1.125 at the top, or inch and an eighth. The tapered design, has all the strength where it's needed at the crown, and it reduces all the weight where it's not needed at the top, simplifying things and making the aesthetics of your bike look much, much better. And where are we today then? Well, most bikes tend to have bigger head tubes on the front and tend to have internal bearings. The tapered steer tube is what we see on virtually every mountain bike today, uh, for good reason. It's very adaptable, it's light enough in weight, and it enables to have huge amounts of suspension travel and the fork to be stiff enough on there. But there are a few different standards floating around, so we're just going to whiz past a few of them. Now the first one is the 44mm straight, so that refers to the size of the head tube, and this was really the first sort of movement away from the old external cup bearings that you used to see on frames like this old GT Zaskar. Now 44mm had internal bearings and you'd have a straight steer tube on the inside of there. Uh, you could fit a, a tapered steer tube but you would need an external bearing at the bottom. The next up was the 49mm straight and essentially the same thing, a bit bigger enables you to basically house things a bit better. Now this is seen on quite a lot of modern frames. It's not the most popular but you do see this on bikes like Intense on the market. But by far the most common option out there is the Zero Stack ZS 4456 system. Now you see this on so many bikes, and this is actually what I'm just going to look at right here. 
This is it, so you have your ZS44 on the actual cup itself that sits into the frame, and you have the same on the bottom one, the 56. Okay, so let's take a quick look at a typical 4456 zero stack tapered setup. This is what you see on most mountain bikes. This is what's in this mountain bike to my right. It's in fact actually on all of my mountain bikes at home, same system. So you have that staff angled nut, which sits on the inside of your fork. If you look closely on this fork, you can actually see it on the inside. And you have this top cap that sits neatly onto your stem with the five millimeter bolt that screws into that star fangled nut, pulling the lock together. Now at the top of the headset, you have the cap that sits on the top. This keeps out the crap and it's quite nice. Underneath that, you have your compression ring, which is a split metal ring and it's got a slight taper to it. This sits into the top of the bearing, basically just to take up the slack in the system. Again, it doesn't adjust the bearing. These bearings are non-adjustable. All it does is eliminate any play in the system to make sure it moves nice and smoothly. Now the bearing sits into the cup. This is a zero stack cup, presses into the frame. When this is in, as you can see, there's almost just a little rim that pokes out. It's very, very compact. So I'm just gonna put this together just so you can see just how low in stack that actually is when you get all the devices. So that is the entire top part of the headset, but all you would see is from this line upwards on the frame. It's the same exact concept for the bottom. You have a cup that pushes into the bottom of the frame. You have the bearing that pushes into that cup. You have a little rubber seal that goes around the bottom of there. And then you have the crown race. Now, these used to be a single piece and you used to have to put these on with a specific tool. But these days they're split rings. So you can actually fit these by hand. You don't even need a special crown race installation tool in order to fit this to the fork. But that would sit on the top of the fork and it would spin around nice and easy like that. In fact, let's just uh, slot it together over a fork just to show you just how simple the system is. There you go, so that represents the bottom part of your headset, that represents the top, and your stem would go on there, and then you would have your, your top cap on the top afterwards. Super, super simple, and literally you need four mil and a five mil Allen key to sort it all out, brilliant system. Now there's also the whole integrated versus integral thing. So this is a zero stack cup that sits into the frame. It's got a 45 degree angle and the bearing sits on that 45 surface. Of course, like we said earlier in the video, some frame manufacturers on particularly on lightweight frames are choosing to put that 45 degree angle directly onto the head tube of the bike. So the bearing could essentially sit straight into the frame. Now this is a really cool, really neat system. You don't have as much choice or freedom in exactly what you're specking on the front of the bike there. You can't change the angle or do anything like that. It's very neat and very, very minimal and lightweight. So you're definitely gonna see that creeping in a bit more as far as lightweight frames go. But uh, other than that, this is where we are with headsets today. Now, it can be a bit of a minefield to try and sort of understand exactly what there is for your bike, but there are resources that can help with this. Now, here at GMBN Tech, we often use the Hope Technical Guide. It gives a pretty comprehensive and techy look at headsets with all the different measurements. It's well worth a read, and it's gonna be in the description underneath. Okay, so that's where we are currently up to date, but where do we go next in future? Well. You've only got to look at e-bikes and longer travel forks out there to kind of get a, an idea of what's going to happen. So you've got 1.125 or inch and an eighth, whatever you want to call it at the top, and you've got 1.5 inch at the bottom. This is getting bigger. Because forks are having to deal with a lot more these days, whether it's on an e-bike with the load of the bike, or if you're a really demanding enduro racer, you put more strain on the front end of the bike. So you're going to start seeing that 1.5 expanding out to 1.8 inches. We've already seen it in the e-bike world, and it's coming. You're gonna start seeing this across the board on heavy duty bikes. Don't be afraid though, you're not gonna need this on all bikes. It will be on extreme bikes that put an incredible amount of load into the front end. But uh, yeah, it's another standard, but actually it's a really good, useful one and definitely fit for purpose. And uh, that's pretty much it with headsets. They're a great part of the bike and they do need a little bit of TLC every now and then. So why don't you put it on yourself to give your headset a bit of TLC after watching this video right now and uh, let us know in the comments what you think of the video and if there's anything else you want us to make. Let us know as always. Thanks a lot, see you later.